Well, I will second Pat's comment that this is one of my favorite all-time nights. Right? It's pretty awe-inspiring, isn't it? You guys out there? Or it's just me, but I think listening for me to be in the audience, listening to people that went through the program claim their authority as writers and uh, speak with so much seriousness about their process is, whoa, it's killing me. So I'm delighted to be here tonight to introduce Nico Taranovsky and doubly delighted to be in the audience as he shares his experience um, writing his provocative and compelling thesis project, Its Own Society. I've never heard Nico present on this subject, so I'm going to be fascinated. A gifted writer and teacher, Nico's insatiable interest in all things process and craft, and his ability to share that passion with others make him an ideal choice for this evening's conversation. One of the great joys of working with students over the long haul, and indeed well before thesis begins, is seeing the evolution of both the writer and the work, and that has certainly been true for me in Nico's case. From the beginning of our time together, I was struck by his great mind and his incredible work ethic. And anybody who has had a class with Nico knows that both of those are true. Everything we did in class interested him. And while the lessons often meant for him a return to his work, a departure from what he'd done into a deep and radical revision and letting go of page after page, he was never deterred. What he was after from the start was the best book he could write at any given moment, and he has never faltered from that goal. It's been a pleasure to witness his process from this project's inception through thesis to what I can only imagine it has become in these last months. Now this part is really important. To my mind, the best thesis experience really should be a beginning rather than an ending. And particularly with the novel, where the work will have to go on for years beyond the program. So the serious writer has got to accept that when they're walking out the door, they're walking toward the book they're going to write. They haven't finished the book they're going to write. So what is required of the novelist in thesis and beyond is a daily devotion and attention to the project and a willingness to learn from the text from now on, rather than from a teacher. Discipline, dedication to the craft, a belief in the power of story, an appreciation for the many gifts of revision, faith in all that the book will eventually become. All of these are traits a successful novelist will need, and Nico Taranovsky possesses them all. So I'm so pleased he's here tonight to present. Welcome, Nico. Society. I'm not really going to talk about it very much today. Um, but I figured if I don't at least say something about the content of the book, you're going to be kind of confused as I go forward. So a while back when I was writing, I wrote myself a little teaser, you know, like the back of the book blurb that you would read in the bookstore and be like, oh my god, I have to get this. <laughs> so this is my teaser, and this is all you're getting in the actual content of the book tonight. Scarred after years of war and a brutal defeat, the kingdom of Zostria has at last found peace and freedom. Yet the city starve and are filled with refugees. The church calls for an inquisition. The nobles openly work against their king, and beneath this simmering discontent, a cabal of powerful men have gathered to overthrow the kingdom in the name of God. Tiernan, the intersex nephew of the king and the head of his spy service, will do anything to protect his uncle and his own position. Liam, a woman posing as a man, is the new royal physician who discovers this plot against the king, a plot hatched by Lord Throckmorton, Tiernan's father, and Prince Marriott, third in line to the throne. But what these four have failed to realize is that they are mere pawns in a conspiracy that stretches back hundreds of years 
and will change the very nature of the universe. <laughs> Don't you want to read that? <laughs> okay, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> um, okay, so I, it's so funny to listen to everyone talk because I had the same exact sort of feelings. Like, oh, I've been to colloquium so many times before and I'm so excited to go to colloquium. And then I realized I have no idea what colloquium is actually about. I, I wanted someone to give me some very clear definition of what I was supposed to be writing about and speaking about. And so even before she had a chance to, I emailed Ruthie back like two seconds after she asked me. It was like, well, what? What, what am I doing? And um, she sent this to me and to everyone else. And this is basically what she asked us to talk about. And she said, if the, the line that was important to me here was, if you need inspiration, go back and look at your artist's statement. Um, and so I did go back and look at my artist's statement. Um, and I'm just going to read this first paragraph because I think it's important. It sort of sums up my artist's statement. That, it's the opening paragraph to it. One of the most distinct memories from my childhood is watching a PBS documentary about the Holocaust. Those images of dead bodies and bulldozers remain at the very surface of my imagination. As a child, I could not understand how any of the Nazis, be they generals, party leaders, brown shirt thugs, or even every party supporters, arrived at and justified their beliefs. It was beyond my comprehension why so few Germans resisted Nazi authority. I have struggled with these two issues, the power of belief and the tensions between social structure and individual agency ever since. They are at the center of almost all of my intellectual inquiry, and they are the primary themes in its own society. Um, we're also not really going to talk about this either. <laughs> um, and that's because one of the things that I was really found remarkable when I went back to look at my thesis is that um, there was something really pivotal missing from it. Uh, in fact, the reason why I connected with those images very early on was not there, and that really needed to be in there. And, and so I didn't understand why I didn't include it in my thesis statement, and so I am including it today. Um, the, the issue that was missing from my artist statement was that story that sort of buried deep down inside me, the one I keep retelling over and over and over. And, I think all writers have that story that they keep going back to. It's what drives their, their, um, it's what drives their storytelling. So I'm going to go back to the beginning, um, and and this is this is me really close to the beginning. It's uh, it's not necessarily the beginning. The beginning was 1971, but um, this is 1976 and. In this picture, I'm five years old. You can tell it's 1976 because I'm wearing a brown leisure suit and have enormous lapels. <laughs> so when I was born, and I promise, even though I'm saying that, it's not going to take two hours to give this presentation. When I was born, although I was perfectly healthy, I was whisked away to the ICU because I was born with ambiguous genitalia, and doctors couldn't tell whether I was a boy or a girl. And, and it's that that constituted the emergency. That's it. I was fine, I was good, but because they couldn't tell if I was a boy or a girl, I went to the ICU and I stayed there for quite some time. I didn't have contact with my mother or father. It was a very sort of isolating beginning. Um, and I was very quickly sent to a specialist in pediatric endocrinology. And trust me, this has something to do with writing. Um, and this is him, and I really was startled by the fact that he's still in practice. Uh, he's still doing what he's doing today. And he's been doing it, I think, for around 30 or 40 years. Um, this is Dr. David. I know Dr. David very well. This is a small, gentle man who speaks with a slight French accent. And he is, for lack of a better word, evil. Evil in the sense that he was just doing his job, following his training, and doing what society demanded. I would visit him as I grew up several times each year, and each time I would visit him, my parents were told to wait in the waiting room. They weren't allowed to come in with me. I was stripped naked and laid on a cold steel examination table, and Dr. David would examine in the most excruciating ways possible my genitalia. And because this was a teaching hospital, 
He often had six or seven residents or medical students working with him, and he would offer each of them the chance to examine my body. All of his efforts were geared toward creating a normal little boy. He would have long conversations with me about things like oral sex and how to penetrate a woman. He would tell me over and over again, you are a normal little boy. He started me on hormone therapy so that for all outward appearances, with my clothes on, I would be a normal little boy. But anyone with a modicum of intelligence quickly realizes that if the flesh you wear is a disguise created by synthetic hormones, then you're not a normal little boy. That if you have to be told you're a normal little boy, you're not one. And these examinations and the absolutely meaningless surgeries that followed, the scars of which I carry to this day, that had nothing to do with my health and everything to do with satisfying a binary notion of gender and sexuality, these went on for years. They went on until I was 15, and I was too large and too sentient to be forced back onto that table. So that is where I write from, that cold metal slab of an examination table, that antiseptic smell, the bright lights focused on my genitals. And that's why I started writing, because people had to know what Dr. David was doing. Because I needed to make others aware of that trauma, of that evil. The evil that wears the white coat, the sheriff's badge, or the judge's robes. The evil that follows laws, rules, traditions, customs, and beliefs. The, evils that it, the evil that is good, kind, gentle people just doing their job and following orders. And that story had to be told perfectly. Because I owed it to myself, but to my five-year-old self, and to the victims of police shootings, and to the millions killed in slavery or in the Holocaust, to tell that story perfectly. And that's a pretty terrible place to try to write from in your first novel, when you've taken a few classes at the loft and are just entering your MFA. But that was my plan. <laughs> so I took groundings in fiction. I wrote 100 pages of my novel. And then I took advanced fiction, and I realized that I knew nothing about writing, that everything I had done in Groundings was wrong, and I started from the beginning. <laughs> and I kept doing this over and over and over again. The novel point of view, I mean, Sheila just told you all this stuff. Waterstone, hundreds of pages written and thrown away, partially because it was never good enough to tell that story that was so critical, and partially because I was always learning new things, and I never wanted to have that writing be fixed in stone when I had more information and more ways to add to it. Um, all that sounds really sad right now, but it was, it was good what happened. It was, doing all those classes and throwing all of that stuff out was critical. If I hadn't had do, done all of that work, I wouldn't be where I am now, and I am in a, a very good place now. So there's a happy ending. Um, so, I did a, 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 as much work as I could in classes. I read everything I could after a few classes, and I started to be exposed to other genre, but genres by my teachers. I read everything I could. I read as widely and deeply as possible outside of my fantasy genre across cultures. And, and then I began to realize that taking courses, independent studies, um, doing all of that, it is it's sort of like encountering the tip of an iceberg. You think you've mastered a subject, and then you crash into everything that's underneath that subject. And I began to understand, through independent studies, actually mostly with Sheila, that, and, and actually one with Larry Sutton, that if I wanted to learn these things, to really feel like I had a mastery over the craft, which for some reason I needed before I could progress to tell this story, that I, I had to teach. And that was the way I would learn more than anything. Because you can't go into a classroom and sort of know what you're talking about, or approach a student and say your point of view is off, or your plot points are off, and then expect to be able to explain why until you really have mastered that. And so I was very lucky, because right when I needed it, uh, the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop started up, and through them I got to teach, and I have taught Introduction to Fantasy and I have taught uh, the novel plot and structure, and I have taught point of view, and I'm teaching point of view again. Um, but then what happened was all of that lovely stuff was occurring. I was rewriting over and over again, and 
I all of a sudden had to write thesis because I had reached 48 credits. And, and it, that was a shock to me, that it was six years had gone by and it was time to write a thesis. I didn't really want to do it, um, but my wife would not be happy if I didn't. So I, I got to the point where I, I had to do this work and I'd scrapped everything that I'd run before, and in very short order, I had to not just write the story, but create this world, because as a fantasy writer, I wasn't going to be writing in this world. And that was very for a very particular reason. I think that when we read stories that are set in this world, we're familiar with the settings, and we can sort of ignore them. But when you're reading a fantasy world, and you're having to learn the world as the author describes it to you, Things that would seem blasé or normal in this world all of a sudden seem shocking because the cultures are different, different the traditions are different. Um, that's a really big thing to create a world. And uh, it's a really big thing to create a world, especially when you're on a tight deadline and you've got to do it for a thesis. And so I sort of, um, I chickened out and I went to try to see what other people were doing. So this is my time for a nerdy question. Who knows what this is? Anybody? Shout it out. Westeros. It was Westeros. So for those of you who are giving me blank stares right now, um, Westeros is the continent, or one of the continents, on which um, A Game of Thrones it is by George R. R. Martin is written. Now, the really interesting thing about this, and something I didn't realize until I started poking around the internet, that when you did something you would do after you read Martin, is that Westeros is actually the UK and Ireland flipped upside down and combined. And, and that's, not, that's not terribly surprising when you start to look at what George R. R. Martin did because vast portions of his series were either derived directly from or inspired by the disastrous 15th century war between York and, and uh, Lancaster noble houses, which we call today the War of the Roses. Um, and if George R. R. Martin can borrow things, so can I. Um, now, I'm going back a little bit to my artist statement. And that is, since I was a, a young child, I had that image of my mind in the Holocaust with its bodies and bulldozers. And I knew that that template for my world would be in Germany in the 20th century. My, my story is set in a um, late medieval, early Renaissance period, but the the template for it, the historical template, is Germany in the 20th century. Um, in my research, I read about the rise of the German Empire in the 1870s and its utter collapse in, the 19, in 1918, including the complete destruction of the monarchy and the near absolute power vacuum it created. I studied the transition from the German Empire to the Weimar Republic, a republic with one of the most progressive constitutions of its time, a time of radically shifting values, mores, and freedoms. And of course, I read about how those shifting values and hard-won freedoms, pro pro progressive politics, and the Jews were then scapegoated for everything from the loss of the war to the deplorable state of Germany's economy. And then, in almost no time at all, I turned out thesis and graduated. <laughs> So I, I was putting this presentation together and I was looking back at thesis and what I had learned from the whole experience and there was a tremendous amount, a sense of mastery over a craft, no matter how nation that mastery might be, is a real accomplishment. But like all accomplishments, it's now in the past. My process continues to shift and change and shortly after I finished thesis, I became obsessed with life experience and how to translate it into art. Because you can only learn so much from taking or teaching classes or from reading about the craft of writing. This world I'm writing is often racked by violent storms. The threatened king is drugged to, drugs to induce a state akin to madness. My protagonist is cornered and attacked by a mob, their bones broken, their body bruised. These things cannot be brought to life with the aid of craft books or classes. For these, I turn to my own experience. And I'm, I'm, right now I'm reading Swan's Way by Marcel Proust, and I, I came across this um, passage, and I, I'm sorry, I know I'm probably short on time, but I'm going to read the whole thing to you anyway. <laughs> this is him describing asparagus. What fascinated me would be the asparagus 
tinged with ultramarine and rosy pink which ran from the heads, finely stippled in mauve and azure, through a series of imperceptible changes to their white feet, still stained a little by, their soil, by the soil of their garden bed, a rainbow loveliness that, would not of, that was not of this world. I felt that these celestial hues indicated the presence of exquisite creatures who had been pleased to assume vegetable form, who, through the disguise which covered their firm and edible flesh, allowed me to discern in this radiance of earliest dawn these hinted rainbows, these blue evening shades, that precious quality which I should recognize again when, all night long after a dinner at which I had partaken of them, they played, lyrical and coarse in their jesting as the fairies in Shakespeare's dream, at transforming my humble chamber pot, or hum my humble chamber into a bower of aromatic virtue. <laughs> so, I wanted to read this because this, this person, Marcel Proust, Proust uh, obviously has experienced asparagus. <laughs> and, and that's what my goal has become now, to experience the world and then be able to translate it into art. Um, so, I know the question is coming of after thesis, so I'm answering it right now. Uh, I have become in many ways an experienced junkie since graduating thesis. I run outside into lightning storms to write wind and rain and thunder with vivid clarity. I've savored the knowledge of what a broken limb feels like so I can understand the exact nature of the pain that my protagonist endures at the hands of the mob. I've tried pot for the first time so I, can, uh, so I could describe the experience and the dramatic shifts of time and space that my drug king endures. And I have spent far too long looking at blades of grass, steam rising from tea, butter melting in a pan, and spiders who have mysteriously fallen into the freezer and died an icy, incomprehensible death without the possibility of escape. <laughs> More than anything at this point in my writing career, I need these experiences to make my story come to life. There is one experience that I don't need any more of, one that I don't need to research, one that I already have, the one at the core of my novel, that cold steel slab of an exam table. I've even put a version of it into my story. It keeps me focused while I write. And the most amazing thing that has happened over the last six years is that my story no longer needs to be perfect. Because in the end, it turns out that my reader, the one I've been trying to explain this to all along, is that small child. And he's a pretty forgiving reader. And that is a much more comfortable place to write in. And I think that's a remarkable six years. Thank you. Get off the stage as fast as possible. So if you have any questions for me, please ask them and then I'll scurry away. Yeah. Um, did Dr. David become a, a character, an antagonist in the novel? Dr. David is actually what I call an inquisitor in my knowledge. And inquisitors are people who mandate the laws of flesh, which basically describe whether you're human or not in the novel. And the inquisitors have the table, and they have the instruments that are required to do so. And um, yeah, he's there. And he's pretty nasty. And other people have read him about him in, the, in writing groups and stuff like that, from, that have read my work from him. Yeah? Could you describe the process of moving from all that research and then just having to crank it out? Um, <laughs> I don't know how that worked. Actually, no, I do. What happened was I had to, I had to um, write six or seven hours a day to get thesis done. And that was the most miraculous moment of my entire writing life, and it is one that I have recently cleared the decks for, so as Sheila said, I can go back into the novel now. And all I will be doing is writing, and I will, if everything aligns, write six or seven hours a day for the next year or two. Um, and by writing six or seven hours a day, it didn't matter how little prep I had done for the story. It just, it just, after 
two painful weeks of that, everything just flowed out. And that was amazing. Sheila keeps telling me that, and I, I didn't believe her, but it, I found it to be absolutely true in there. So just believe Sheila? Yes, just believe <laughs> Sheila. Trust me. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, wait, one more thing. I forgot because I was really nervous. I, I cannot thank Sheila, and I cannot thank Emma Ball, my thesis advisors, enough. They have guided me to this point, and without them and without the program, I, I would not be here. And I am so very, very, very grateful to be here. So thank you. And good.